Hello, good afternoon. I'm Heinz and you are live on live, Love Unlocks live sessions. And it's so good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really cool for your line today. Why do we do this? Love Key is the ministry that we have that runs this event. And the whole point is to share stories of how God has unlocked people's lives. Why? Because I, we really believe that when people have an encounter with God, they can align with these purposes and reign in life. And then we can have healthy families building a healthy nation. That is our ultimate dream and goal. And we want to be a part of that. So thank you for joining us today. And, uh, and for all the people that are logging on, I'm seeing so many friends coming on board. Uh, we've got Julia, Morgan, Monica, Natasha, Judy, Mary. Great. Welcome, welcome. Hello to all of you. It's so great to see you. And when you do come on board live, it's, it'll be so great to hear from you. Please tell us hello, where you're from. If you have any questions uh, for Frank, uh, please keep them appropriate. Uh, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, and because we would love to just engage as we do this as well. But obviously, it's going to be mostly an interview with, uh, with Mr. Frank Rotenbach. And with that, and without any further ado, I want to introduce you to an amazing man, uh, a talent actor. You uh, probably know him from... Faith Like Potatoes and other movies that he's done. He uh, recently brought a, a great book that is a memoir of his life story. And uh, he's been some amazing speaking it's around the nation. And I've been to some of the churches where he has been to. We kind of, it, sometimes it felt like we're tag teaming. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what, a, what a great man of God and uh, what an inspiration. He's married to Lee. They're back in South Africa. And it's such a great privilege to welcome him. On the on the program and uh, so please give a big hand and welcome for mr frank rotenbach or whoever we right currently <laughs> we're not gonna have <laughs> next <laughs> hey bro thank you so much for being here it's so good to have you on love unlocks and uh, thanks for making the time i really appreciate it it's good to be here for uh, thanks for inviting me i appreciate it uh, i just quickly had a squizzy on the lead and there are people looking from there, there's someone from florida having a look Oh, cool. uh, someone, someone from uh, Durban, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I see like there. It's... Bonjour. Yeah, I, I, just look at this. I can put on, on the screen. Feed it. Me... Here we go. Marie, Marie Lawrence Humbier. I don't know how to say it. Bonjour. Oh. De la... <laughs> Umber. 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 Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Marie Lawrence. Bonjour. Ça va? Ça va bien. <laughs> oh, Je parle. Someone... Sorry. Je pense à être parce que je suis en France pour uh, quatre mois. Je joue le rugby. Uh. Wow, that is impressive. Well done, dude. I can't give you that for us, probably. Well, I can drag you. I can fake it by good. Well done. Oh, we got someone all the way from Liberia. This is uh, your line village from Liberia. My. Wow. That is not a name I was expecting to see from Liberia. That's so cool. West Africa. And then, you know, homegrown. Fli from Athenbos. Melinda from Zimbabwe. Thank you so much for joining us. It's so great What's to up, see you guys. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Way to be here. So how we do Love Unlocks is uh, we take a moment to, to help everybody to just know our guests if you maybe don't know them. And maybe you know about them, but you don't know so much interesting facts about them that you think you may know. So we do a little bit of a, a, a some quickie question, and, and then we get into the meat of things. So, so I just want to first of all ask our guest, Mr. Frank. Rock and back. We, we, we dubbed his surname Rock and Back after, after a game of golf we played together. Uh, That's right. <laughs> I, this, I have to do this right off the bat to get it out of the way. So, how old are you, bro? I just turned 48. Woohoo! <laughs> 48. And you know what? 21 with 27 years' experience. There That's you really go. what it comes down to. I like no. that. I like that. I also feel, I feel 22. I don't know why 22, but 22 stands out for me as a year that I really enjoyed. So <laughs> I feel like I'm 22, but then I look in the mirror and I go, okay, there's some, there's some mileage, but at least, you know, we're young at heart. I think that's the important thing. Wrinkles test in, but that's the soul, right? <laughs> Ooh, that's deep. I like that. <laughs> You're married to the beautiful E. I want to know for how long now? Well, we're in our 25th year, so we've been married for 24 years and I think almost wow. six months now. That's amazing. Yeah. What, is, what is that traditional thing you have to do at 25? Uh, 25 is a silver wedding anniversary, and so I think you crack an expensive bottle of champagne and have a fun night with your friends. Yeah, we go. Yeah, hopefully by that time we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can gather together. It'll be, it'll be in February next year. Yeah. Great. I'm sure by then, you know, we'll have some kind of... Way to do that. That'll be great. Um, 
So, yeah. And then, well, it's going to be a Zoom Zoom anniversary. Yeah. That, like your birthday. Like we, we surprised Frank yep. his birthday with a massive Zoom call of friends from That's all right. around the world. That was it's epic, best. man. How did that feel? Mm. Incredible. Actually, it was one of my best birthdays ever because I, I don't think when you have a party at your house, you ever have that sort of concentrated moment where everyone's looking everyone in the eye and yeah. speaking to each other and, and you had such kind things to say. I was, I was surprised. I was wondering who you guys are talking about, but uh, <laughs> evidently it was me. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, everyone it was just, I, I think what blessed me or, or what was so encouraging was that you you loved me well, you know, you, you, the things people said they meant, and it was something they knew about me that, that they felt that they had seen that I'd not maybe necessarily been aware of, but they saw it and they, they called it. So, uh, makes you want to live up to it. That's awesome. Yeah. Calling out the golden people. I love that about birthdays, but it's mm. something we shouldn't just wait to do on birthdays, right? We should be doing that all the time. Uh, yep. We've got, a, we've got a friend who's a, a counselor and she's got this great thing where she tells people, you need to be your best friend and a best friend will never focus on all the negative all the time. They will be focusing on the positive. So when you speak to yourself, you know, speak how you, sh how you would have spoken to your best friend when you encourage them. And I thought that's, that's yep. pretty cool. Um, it's very good. Oh, Morgan said it's her birthday today. Well, happy birthday, Morgan. That's awesome. <laughs> Where's my guitar? Uh, happy birthday. birthday to you. <laughs> Go, Frankie. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday, dear. Morgan. Over to you. Happy birthday to you. Beautiful. Boom. Yay. That's cool. I love that. A little bit of impromptu. Now, back to you and Lee. I, I'm always mm. interested to know that the courting period, like from when you guys knew this, you know, we're in love, we're a couple until the moment you popped the question. How long was it from you, when you guys were, you know, started dating, courting, and then when you got, had the, finally had the guts to, you know, ask that big question? What was that period? A month. What? <laughs> oh, my word. That was There's a, a story to it. Uh, I met Lee in uh, October of 94, went to Cape Town many moons ago. And we became very good friends in... January of 20, 2000, no, 1995, gosh, long time ago. And, um, and we were just really, really good friends. We were close friends. We spent a lot of time together. And about two months in, a friend of mine said to me, um, hey, what's up with that girl? And I said, what do you mean, what's up with that girl? She's a good friend. And, uh, and I said, uh, you know, I'm just spending a lot of time with her. There's, there's nothing there. And he goes, well, does she know that? And I was like, uh, I don't know. He says, well, maybe you should tell her. So I, I met with Lisa Taylor. Listen, I'm only getting married in my 30s. Uh, I love hanging out with you. Love being your friend. So let's just be friends. And she was like, cool. Um, you know, and I told her, I already know what, what kind of wife I want to marry. And it's not you. Spoken Yo. like a mature 20, like, spoken like a mature 22. Year old. Ouch, so, that's hectic. So, so fortunately, Lee is very secure in herself. So she was just like, yeah, I don't mind hanging out with you. You know, dumb comment aside, but other than that, we're good. And then we were friends for a very long time until about, I think it was about September of that year. Um, and uh, eventually I just said to him, this is getting confusing because it, it's where, you know, I, I've developed feelings for you, but they're different to what I've ever felt before. Because, you know, the kind of girl I used to date was sort of popular type, uh, outgoing, loud type, you know, um, in group type people. And Lee's more like yeah. an artist and okay. she's just a natural beauty and, and she's a thinker, you know, she, 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 when she talks, everyone listens because she doesn't do it a lot. And it was just weird for me. And, and so the next thing I knew, I think the best way I can describe it is that it's something I felt in my heart more than anything else. And I said, I think we should date. And then two days later, I told her, I think I'm confused and I don't know what I'm doing. So you take your road. I'll take my road. If we ever meet again, that'll be good. Poor girl. And I had the 10 <laughs> most miserable days of my life. <laughs> and I phoned her and I said, listen, I'd rather be with you and figure this out than be without you. And then, uh, yeah, a month later we were engaged. And then it was about a half months after that we got married. And that was wow. 24 years ago. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that. I love that. You know, you had your moments of, of, you know, confusion and stuff, but you, you, mm. you went, you didn't let that derail you completely. I think that's awesome. Even for a, you know, immature 20 year old. That's, that's well. Yeah. 
I think I think part of it was I think maybe instinctively I knew in my heart that if if I get engaged or if I get married to the school, or if I spend any uh, amount of time, a, a lot of my insecurities and woundedness was going to have to go. Yeah. And we love hanging on to those things. And I think at the time, what was confusion was just my heart being fearful that I actually would be exposed for who I really am. Because I, I think Tim Keller often says, it says, the greatest thing that you will ever experience is to be fully known and fully loved at the same time. Yeah, sure. That's and the cool. ultimate thing of that is, is God. God fully knows us and fully loves us. He knows how wicked we can get and how backstabbing we can get and still loves us. He knows when we feel joy or when we are kind or whatever, but he fully knows us, but yet loves us. And I, and I think Lee's the kind of person that has that kind of relationship with a person where she, when she's in, she's in. <laughs> and I think that scared me, sure. you know, oh. but I got over it. You know, so. <laughs> and you loved it back. Well, wow, that's awesome. And mm -hmm. right. So, you know, I remember when we Zoom called you on your birthday, you were busy, yeah. busy with a very nice steak on the Barbie, uh, mm -hmm. on the braai. And uh, so, yeah. I, so I was wondering today, thinking of questions, what, what is your favorite thing to cook at home versus favorite thing to order at a restaurant? Gosh, um, I think what's funny is I, I love the whole process of, of cooking and of, it and of sharing it with people pairing it with a wine. So I call it my flavor sensations. I, I just love that kind of thing. Um, so the thing that I do really enjoy making is a fillet steak. I mean, I, I really enjoy, uh, you know, a properly made fillet steak on the, on the barbecue. For me, proper means crispy on the outside, medium rare on the inside. And yes, then, thank you. Preach it. <laughs> I, I remember when I was in Europe, I, I loved in France. I, I mean, of all places, the cuisine is off the charts and the same in Italy, but steak frites which was basically chips and stuff the salad. <laughs> it's basic, yeah, I mean, it's like that proper red wine. It's, it's just, it's so simple, but it works. Wow. But Lee and I, here's the deal. Lee and I have really discovered something in this lockdown is because obviously we couldn't go to restaurants or anything. So we just developed a bunch of our own recipes. So we had yellowtail that we barbecued on the fire or bright on the fire. Nice. And we, and we made a Thai curry. Then we wow. dis discovered roast duck, breast and we made a, a, a Thai curry from that and then curry as well. So we did that. And also checkers has this insane gluten-free egg-free base. Cause my wife's allergic, both to gluten and egg, like actually allergic. It's not a fashion thing, Wow! Uh, but they've got this gluten-free base. It's amazing. Um, I can't remember what the brand is, whatever, but you get morella cheese on top of that with a bit of tomato paste, you know, that you baste. And then you get grilled artichokes, some mushrooms, you can do prosciutto, you can do bacon, whatever. Take that in the oven for 15, 20 minutes, bring it out, slice your avocado, booyah. Wow. I'm hungry. Thank you for that. <laughs> I want to I so go out and eat that now. <laughs> so, so one of the things I used to order a lot, like I said, in restaurants is the steak frit. But there's um, a restaurant called Zibaldoni and they had this tagliata or something. It's it's grilled fillet that they have, but they've got uh, chips of beef with wow. like lettuce with wow. Italian, some uh, is that cheese? Uh, hush, pop, not ham. Um, it's John. Parmesan, 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 Parmesan cheese uh, in the salad, some crouton stuff. So that was really amazing. Did the tata has a fish. And for dessert, I have a chocolate fondant. When it's crispy, yeah. chocolate nuts, crack it in this oh. melted chum. Parking. Sweet as. Man, sounds amazing. Have you, yeah. have you, uh, sounds like you should be, uh, be a tester on Mastiff. Uh, <laughs> <Happy. laughs> you and Lee lived a life for, for quite a long time. I yeah. remember we saw you there shortly after you Gosh. got here, and this is, I mean, this is ages ago. And I was thinking today, I mean, you were there for a long time, you came back. Uh, it was 13 years. Uh, oh. Sure. And and so what was initially like the biggest culture shock for you? And what do you miss about South Africa pretty much the whole way through? The biggest culture shock, I think, in a city like Los Angeles is that it's no city uh, that didn't be uh, and even that it's an American culture shock. I mean, there's there's the the, the general American culture shocks you would have anyways, because uh, you know all the sports different, the schooling systems different, all that stuff's different. Yeah, yeah. But but Los Angeles is unique within the American setup. Um, I've lived in London, I've been the world and lived in different in Europe and all that sort of thing. But LA is so different. I think it sums it up really well. Somebody wants there's a there's a thing on Instagram called Overheard LA or Overheard London or Overheard New York. It's when people are in line at a shopping mall or some or at a, at a grocery store or something, and they overhear someone say something. Yeah. 
and then they write it down. And so I think someone overheard someone said at Trader Joe's or whatever it was this. They said LA is a really, really difficult city because it's full of people who were too good for their hometown. Wow. Including the guy you're looking at. (laughs) (laughs) And it's true. I I think it's true. I think a lot of people, the majority of people who go to LA, in my opinion, uh, go there because they're going, this is the biggest thing I'm ever going to go for. This is the biggest dream. I will sacrifice all my money, all my everything I've got to get it. Because if I have a voice in LA, I have a voice around the world. You put teams of people like that into one confined space. Wow. The competition is off the chart. Yes. The, it's very difficult to form real relationships. It's very difficult to form community. Yeah. Part of the reason is not just because people are miserable or they'd be. Part of the reason is just so much traffic. Wow. So if you're going to go, say, like have a bride at someone's house, well, you're going to mission to shop to get You're going to mission to get a house. You're going to get back. It's always, always traffic. It's just always a yeah, you see the uh, gridlock pictures of LA and it's like, it's mm-hmm. insane. Yeah. yeah, and there's going to be a gridlock at the store that you're going to because there are tons of people at the store. Wow. You know? <laughs> it's always just congested. And it's for me, I love it. I really enjoyed living there. Okay. Um, I think especially now when I look back, I, I realize how much we did sacrifice and how much we did fight. Because the one thing as well that I will say about LA, which is different to any city I've lived in, is... Uh, I had this saying that I came up with. I said, you never live in LA by it. <laughs> no one ever just lives there. Oh, I just ended up in LA. <laughs> you're you either there intentionally yeah. or you're homeless. One of the wow, two. Sure. There's no saying it there in that sense. You know, I mean, there are homeless shelters and we served in some of those, but gosh, the homeless population was about 34,000 in Santa Monica, I think, when we got there. Sure. And I think when we left in 2018, there's about plus 6,000 people were homeless. Sure. And now with this whole pandemic i think is probably even more yeah and this is and we're talking you know two and a half million to ten million dollar homes is the average sort of home in in santa monica so in that environment to have nothing versus it's weird it's a weird place to live wow that is interesting so it is quite a thing to get used to i can imagine wow okay so to some bit lighter i because i've played golf with you um (laughs) i have to i have to ask yeah. What, your, what, what would you th- what would you say is your most best moment on a golf course? Uh, I, Have you had? Yeah, just, no, just no, 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 <laughs> no. I'm trying to talk the the two the I've had. <laughs> yeah. Which guy I, I think the one I remember the the most was um, we were at Rock, very prestigious course, South African Open, oh, yeah. and just for that now I've played off a snap so I know play and I've really enjoyed it I think I'm currently a four um, and I would finally scrape this together and say to why hey listen why I'm with you know I think deep in my heart it was like going why don't you come with and see how freaking awesome I am okay <laughs> <laughs> why don't you come and with it looks hit a ball 350 meters yeah. you know why come with this me kick someone's butt yeah okay yeah. Of course. And I'll so never forget your it. Your wife is your biggest cheerleader. You want them, you know, to, to brag Dude. on you a little. And yeah. She if she believes in me, if she believes in me, <laughs> bring good. the wall. Amen. Bring the wall, no, baby. I'm going to run straight through you. That's true. So we get to the seventh hole, and I haven't had a particularly good day because I'm obviously trying way too hard than I should. <laughs> and I, the old seventh hole at, at Rand Park was a par four with a slight dog leg to the left and a slight dog leg to the right. It's a, it's a tough hole. I think it was like the stroke four. But there was a little ravine that runs all the way down the left side. So I step up to the plate, my mate tee off, and I slam dunk it straight into the ravine. Pudink. Oh, ouch. And I get there, and for some reason, I don't know how, it stayed out of the water, and it was on the sandy bit, the only sandy bit that was there. But now I've got about a six and a half foot embankment of a retainer wall next to me that's keeping this river where it should be. So I reckon, okay, I'm going to go in there. But now as I go down there, I calculate that I'm going to have to take one shoe off and roll my, 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 my one pant leg up, okay? <laughs> Sorry, is your, Which, wife, is your wife in the golf cart or just standing by? Or where is she she's, she's walking with me. So okay. she's standing there with right. me walking. Okay, okay? and I've got, okay. I've got a pool cart. I've got a pool cart at that stage. I still had a pool cart for my, for my clubs. All right. And I, and I park the clubs there. And I, I've seen pros do this on TV. I mean, it's a, it's a regular thing because when you're a low handicap, you're always trying to save shots. Yeah. So I'm going going to drop this and i'm good enough i can play it out of this ravine yeah chip close make a par make a bogey at worst let's go impress your wife <laughs> that's right what happens is our club ball 
and it goes straight into the embankment. Khudung gets even worse into the water. Oh. I, I try and hit it again. By now, there's oaks on the on the tee box waiting to tee off. And oh, I'm just hunting. And eventually, I'm like so done with this. Then my golf cart falls into the flipping ravine. But no. for some reason, it started sliding. And my whole, all my clubs, everything in the ravine. Oh. I'm so mad. I take it by the scruff of the neck. I took my <laughs> golf clubs by the scruff of the neck. I throw it onto the bank. I climb out. <laughs> I've got my one shoe in my hand and my pants pulled up. <laughs> and I'm walking down the fairway, steam coming out of my ears. And I look behind me and my wife is doubled over from <laughs> laughing so hard. <laughs> she can hardly breathe. That's amazing. Wow. The oaks and the tea dots are just like, dude, just get on with it. And my wife is just crying. I mean, she's like, I need a bathroom now. That's yeah, so, so funny. Oh, man. That is awesome. Yikes. Very awesome. Yeah, let's one, th- one thing I'll add to that is one thing advice to a younger self right never lose your temper because yeah. every time i lost my temper on the golf course it cost me at least 500 rand in replacing a shaft <laughs> once <laughs> the other one is uh oh yeah to replace a golf cart because i kicked my wheel and i couldn't fix it and then the final one was um i was at rand park 12 hole beautiful par five um, and the fan of my five iron i can just hook it around the trees and of course, it didn't hook around the trees. It went dead right to the other side. I got so mad, I helicoptered my club, which is like you throw your club and it goes. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is it got stuck in a flipping uh, in a pine tree. Oh. So my cousin said, don't worry, I'll fix it. He takes my four iron, throws it up even higher than that one. It doesn't. <laughs> that is brilliant. Oh, my word. So we got two grams with the clubs in the tree. So I have to climb the tree. So I climbed the tree. When I came back, I'd gum all over my hair. I'd blood no on my hands. Even though it was a, yeah, don't lose your temper on the course. It's oh not good. Oh, my goodness. It sounds like you can write another book just on golf mishaps. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. no, good. So that's golf course. But what you really do is, is act. And so I, I need mm-hmm. to know, has there been any, any sort of embarrassing moments on film sets? Or maybe the, the one that stands out? You can share with oh, us. There's, there's one that immediately comes to mind. I, I remember in my first sort of months of being on seven that the show started, you know, yeah. and, and I was definitely green, you know, so I was still learning the ropes and, and so on. And um, I think it was episode 70 or something. So it must have been like three or four months. And, and my character didn't look on there because he was an alcoholic. So that happens is someone's up with him or he messes up a relationship. I can't remember. And so he starts drinking. Okay, and I was talking to the doctor on the phone. Uh, I think it, um, Dr. Nkambinde, I think was the name. It's uh, wow. Ntati Moshesh played it. Okay. Wonderful actress. So Ntati is on the phone with me and she's, she's busy talking and I'm sitting there with a bottle. <laughs> and I'm crying. <laughs> yeah, and I'm crying my heart out. It's working, and I can feel the tears are coming and everything. Halfway through the scene, the director goes, cut, cut. I'm like, what? What? And he's like, dude, there's a booger size of Tantan running down your lip. We can't oh. show people that. <laughs> I, was, I was like, you've got to be kidding me, dude. No. It's the toilet. There's no more tears. The toilet's been flushed. Oh. I have to wait for the water to come back. No way. Anyway, so I had this massive. Yeah, that it just is looked, hectic. At 6.30 at night when everyone's having their dinner, that's that's just not going to oh. work. Yeah. And then you have to do the whole so, thing again and, and hope for the water works. Oh, my word. Uh, so yeah, that was that was. I was trying to others, but uh, it's not. That's a good one. That's a that's hard to top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, oh, there's not been many. No, not been too many. In in your book, you uh, you have a chapter called uh, "Confessions of a Cab." This is his book, by the way. Let me show you the bond. Let me turn it the right way. There you go. Um, yeah, a... You got a, a chapter called "Confessions of a Cab Driver," and there's some very yep. very interesting stories i can see you you know there's a there's a lot more that where that came from um, tons more so if you had to think of like the craziest or the weirdest story that you heard or that happened while you were a cab driver in la what which one stands out for you gosh i i i them, them and i think one of one of the stories was literally i think well, i remember the one day i picked up from this ex- super expensive house in santa monica um uh, I think she worked in two or something and she's the car and uh, Angela's, they got this like <laughs> valley, real, like, valley, yeah, <laughs> valley girl. They talk like that with like a little affectation in their throat. It's like, love y'all. And she was like, yeah. And then he came to the house and he shot him in the side. And I was just wondering why, you know, 
And she's literally talking on the phone about a murder that took place. And what? it's this long conversation. Yeah. Oh, my word. That's big too. I was, I, yeah, I didn't say anything. I mean, what do you say? What do you ask? You know, yeah. so that was one of the things that was crazy. Another crazy thing that happened, I'm not sure if I even put it in the book, but no, I think I, I might have. But, um, you know, like when a couple of drug deals went down in my car, <laughs> which I was, uh, oh. because because I had my limo driver or I was uh, like a, I had a big black SUV yeah. and it's a, 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 the rules are people are allowed to consume alcohol or whatever. It's It's got nothing to do with me. It's not my responsibility. It's, is their, you know, their thing. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it was, it was seriously uncomfortable all night in the middle of South Central LA. I mean, yeah, just crazy. Oh, wow. You know, people, you know, driving up and down the road and you just that you can get, get out of it. You know? That's insane, uh, man. You're... Gosh, I had bachelor parties and I didn't know what to bring in my room. <laughs> <laughs> Rather <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah. No, it, and then it's incredible times of just these incredible stories of, you know, it's, I, I think the one I met was, um, he was a mountain climber, and I didn't know that. Uh, obviously, he got in the car, and we were just talking about the weather, and he said he played Seattle. And I was like, are you kidding me? Santa, Santa Monica is so much nicer than Seattle and, as far as we're concerned. And he said, no, well, he prefers Seattle because of the mountains. Like, ah, let me just check. How many mountains have you climbed? You know, have you climbed any big ones? And he went, yeah, I've climbed all seven of the highest peaks in the world twice. Yo. And then I was like, eh, story time. <laughs> so, I, so I said to him, um, well, tell me what are the like three most important things you need to know if you're going to climb S. And he said to me, there's not three most important things. There's only one most important thing. And then he qualified it by saying, uh, you would have thought, you know, having the right gear, having the right clothing, he says, is important. He says, of course, it's important. It goes without saying it's important. You should know that. You shouldn't even attempt it if you didn't know that that part was important, yeah. having the right backup team, et cetera, et cetera. So all those, those are the obvious important things. Is, but there's only one thing that's really, really important. And he said this, before you leave on the plane to go to Nepal, there's a decision you have to make. And the reason is, is that it usually takes on average about five years to prepare for something like an ascent on Everest. And it probably is going to cost you in the region of about $100,000, including the flight and the permits and all the training you're going to have to do. Sure. So that's an enormous investment of time and money that you're making. And he said, and here's what happens. When you get to the death zone, which is roughly above 26,000 feet, your body can't live anymore. It, there's not enough oxygen there for your body to sustain life. So what happens is once you get to camp four, you camp, and then the next day, whenever it is, it's time to go to the summit. You go to the summit and then you get to the top. You try and get to the top, take your photographs and get out of there before you die. That's literally the game you play. Wow. So you go into the death zone, what they call the death zone, and you start dying. And then you try and touch the top, come down before you're dead, and then you make a descent. Yeah. And so he said what happens is, and he's witnessed this himself personally, is that you could be 30 feet. Now think of 30 feet. It's like a long, longish putt. On a green, yeah. you could be that far from the summit, and there's red f lights flashing inside of you, saying to you, "You're done. It's over. You need to turn around. If you don't turn around right now, you're going to die." And he says that's the decision you have to make before you even get on the plane, because when you're up there, you don't have enough oxygen and ability to make decisions to make that level decision in that moment. Wow, that's the thing no one knows. And he says, "I've seen people die there," and he's and he said to me, "Look, here's the deal." If you turn around, you'll have another shot, but you'll also see your family again. If you don't turn around, you won't have another shot and you won't see your family again. What's more important, your dreams or the other thing, your family? And, and wow. I think for sure. me, an, an act of pursuing my career in LA and, and, you know, and, and just fighting for the big dream and the big Everest, I, I really question you know, a lot of you know, if the red lights are flashing, should you be turning around? Wow. Because, because, because I'm a, I'm a guy that goes for it. You know, um, I enjoy, you know, I'm passionate about stuff and, uh, you know, and I just realized you can't just be an all or nothing kind of person. There's got to be wisdom to what you're doing. There's got to be a both and it can't be either or, you know, and, and I think that story really brought it home to me because I also think that God by his grace, you know, sometimes pulls us off, off the mountains. We can, and, our job is to pray for wisdom, to be wise enough to recognize that he, that's what he's doing. Because I think a lot of us are striving to that top and we've got a on the back of our neck and it's pulling and it's pulling and we're fighting that pull. 
And he's saying, dude, I mean, I think possibly this, and I, and I say this advisedly, I mean, I'm not trying to make a big statement here, but I think sometimes something like this pandemic is like a hand that pulls us back and says, think a bit, guys. What are you chasing? Mm. Where are you heading with all of this? Where are you going, world? Think. Yeah. At least I'm thinking that, you know, these things are allowed. It's not, I don't think God causes them, but I, I think he certainly allows them. And it's in that that you can go, this will cause me to be still. And when I'm still, I'll see that he's waiting there for me. Sure. It's beautiful. Like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that, just one more of these questions I had lined up. Um, what is now that you've been on the journey for so long, you've had all these amazing moments of discovery. Uh, I'm sure you've reevaluated that, that big dream, that life dream. Mm. If you had to summarize what, what that is right now, what would that be? It's so funny. So we uh, asked that question. At, well, it's great that you asked the question because uh, uh, we're currently writing a script. We, we're in the process of, uh, of um, turning my book into a movie. And, and the first part of that is to, to write a script. Yeah. Um, and in the script, I've had to, had to relive the story because the difference between a book, like 220, 250 pages to tell the story. And so you've got space and time. In a movie, you've got like 100 pages to, you know, 100, 110 pages to tell a very, very concentrated story. So you really got to dig deep into it. And so in light of your question, I think the thing that, that I realized was is that when our hearts are wounded and we're not sure who we are and we're not sure who God is and we're not sure that he loves us, we feel like we need to go and earn it. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I'm okay with saying this. I didn't, I didn't have a great relationship with my dad. And I think the net result was if you had to ask me what, what were the two big things in your heart that plagued you your whole life? One was a definitive belief that I'm not loved and that I need to go and find it. Sure. And the other one was a definitive belief that I wasn't good enough and that I needed to go and prove it. Wow. Okay. And so when you're gifted and talented at something, you will use that thing as a tool to give you the security and the identity and the worth that only God can give you. Yes. And so when uh, I was in LA, I eventually got to be represented by one of the biggest agents in the world, William Morris Endeavor. In fact, they probably are the biggest them and CAA. I mean, they rep anyone who's anyone in the entertainment mm -hmm. business as their client and, and they got enormous reach uh, influence I'd, I'd ended up in an audition for superman even just just getting into the audition at warner brothers for superman is an achievement in and of itself it's yeah. it's crazy if you think about it because you don't get to that audition unless you have people of serious influence backing you and saying this guy is great and he should be in there so so from that high i went post that high to losing my whole career and end up being a cab driver for three years and then working as a janitor for two years after that. So for five years, all of what I was used to, my status was stripped away from me. Yeah. And the funny thing is during the latter part of that season of my life, I ended up in an acting school. And I remember when I went to the acting school, I felt God said to me, don't tell people who you are or that you've done anything. Just go there like a student that's never done anything. Wow. And just, just be in the class because if you shine, you'll know that this is what you're supposed to do. And it, and it happened. I mean, I remember this towards the end of my time there, there was this moment where I was acting in a scene with a girl and, and the way I delivered a line to her made her burst into tears. She wasn't supposed to burst into tears, but just, it just touched her so much that she burst into tears and the whole class was like, what? And the teacher or the coach was like, dude, keep going. This is great. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember walking away from that class and thinking to myself, this was not about proving that I'm good at this. This was about finding out what am I supposed to do? Yeah. Because the difference between proving that you're good at it, you're always going to have to prove it. Mm. But when you find out what you're supposed to do, you do it. So you don't do it to get approval. You do it because you've been approved wow. to do it. Yes. So, so Eric Little in the movie Chariots of Fire says, he says, God made me fast. And when I run, it gives him pleasure and I feel it. Yeah. Sure. And, and Harold Adams, the other athlete said, the next 10 seconds will define who I am, a failure or a winner.
But the problem is, if you win that race, you're going to have to do another one and another one and another one. Mm. You never settled. And I think that's the big gift God gave me. And I, and I think that's what he means when he says, if you forfeit your soul to gain the whole world, you've lost everything. But if you end up losing the world, but you find your soul or your heart in him, you don't need the world then in that sense. You know what I'm saying? You don't need accolades of success to say, this is what you're supposed to do. You just need his voice in your heart. And yeah, that creates a lot of security. You know, it, it, it makes you not lazy on the one hand, because you know that you want to honor him and do it to the best of your ability. But on the other hand, it also makes you not insecure that if you weren't as good as somebody else or you didn't get a role, you can go, but this is what I'm supposed to do. And he will decide the outcomes yeah. of the success, you know. That's good. So what is the dream right now then after all of that? Um, I, mm. think, I think I hear what you're saying, but just if you had to say, is it to be the greatest actor you can be and, and, and follow the roles that God has, has for you? Or I, I, I think, you I, yeah, I think I don't really have this massive goal like if this happens then i'll be happy kind of goal i think that's how definitely how i used to be yeah i think i think uh nt wright has an incredible statement that he makes in the book called surprised by hope and he talks about this he says adam was created so that god could reflect his wise rule and wisdom into the world through adam, and from adam reflect glory and praise back to god and there's a cycle that happens so the goal is to be as good an actor as I possibly can be and to write stories. I'm a storyteller. I think I'm a, I'm a, I definitely am a storyteller. So for me right now, the passion from a practical point of view is to, to get the screenplay to a place where I feel like it's reflecting the thing I was made to be and, and God's image in, in, in me reflecting through that storytelling ability so that, so that when people watch that movie, they experiencing a reflection of his wise rule and wisdom into the world uh, through love stories, disappointments, the whole, you know, just how it to play out. And, and that to me is the goal is to, is to embrace that with, with passion and kindness. Yeah. And love. Awesome. I think above all. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense. So practice yeah, no, pursuing, pursuing the career as I possibly can, but trusting God for the outcomes. That's awesome. Yeah. What I love about what you're saying is, um, a friend of mine who's a, a pastor who's had a big impact on my life, he, he summarizes it this way. It says, all of us mm -hmm. are born with two legitimate needs, to be, mm -hmm. to be loved, to be accepted, and to have significance. He says, but if we try to achieve those things in illegitimate ways, then we're busy with idolatry. And, that's, and it's so hard for us not to fall in that trap, you know, of, of trying to get that emptiness filled in a way that, you know, is not being filled by the stuff we're trying. So we try other stuff, or we try harder, or we, we, we take a, you know, a quote and we run with it, uh, or whatever it might be, but never getting that sense of, you know, this is who I am. Because we, if, we, if we chase created things, we, we never meet the creator who has the ultimate plan for our lives. And that's what I'm hearing from, from what you're saying is that God helped you, God helped you to, uh, to unlock, God helped you to unlock that, the, the true identity that you have in him. Yeah. So it's my camera stand. <laughs> Yeah, I heard I heard everything you did, and I think that's that's exactly right. Um, th the thing that I will say is this is that we're all wounded, you know, because the one thing that God the Father said to Jesus after he came out of his baptism, he says, This is my son, the identity, whom I love. Hmm. That's the love, and yeah. in whom I'm well pleased. That's the affirmation. I believe yes, in you. It's all there. So those two powerful statements is is the is it's kind of like the two rhubars of our hearts that hold things together knowing those things that's that's and you need to hear it from the father okay the other thing i will say about idolatry is is that the trickiest things to to navigate is the idolatry of the heart because here's here's the problem the very good things that god wants to give us and wants us to want and have things like 
family, children, work, money, um, good fortune, whatever, whatever you want to call it, great careers. When those things become a greater source of identity and love and worship in your life than God is, that's when they flip into idols. Yeah. And so N.T. Wright talks about uh, redemption this way. He says redemption is not scrapping that which is there and starting over again. But rather it's setting at liberty that which became enslaved. So in the context of my career, it's not that God said, Frank, we need to scrap this thing, this whole idea of you want to be an actor. This is this was a mistake. In fact, we probably need to scrap you because you just messed up so much. I do you know. He's like, no. The problem was I want you to do all those things. I just didn't want you to be enslaved. Isn't that what Paul said? It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Free yeah. from what? Yeah. Free from the enslavement that we enslave ourselves to. Sure. You know, so, so, so the thing that I want to say to people is that, man, when God looks at you, he looks at his original thoughts and his design and his hopes and his love for you. And, it, and he finds deep joy in that. What breaks his heart is the enslavement that's causing you to be a distorted version of his image in you reflected into the world. And he wants to set you free. Mm. You, you know what I'm saying? Wow. So... Yeah, that's so good. Bro. That's the unlocking that I'm so passionate about seeing in people's lives as well. That, and that <laughs> his love does that. It's, it's, you know, you said it yourself earlier. It's, it's because of a lack of love that you experienced from an earthly father that you had this thing that you had to, you know, you had to make a mark. You had to be a man, you know, all these things that mm -hmm. we hold and we think that's the truth. But there's a father mm -hmm. in heaven going uh, just to me and, and, and accept what I have that I am lo that I love you and that I have a plan for mm -hmm. you and we can figure this out together because I already know what you need to do and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's so beautiful um, we have uh, someone here asking uh, who we say happy birthday to is, mm -hmm. uh, he, he is asking um, how long have you been a Christian for? and I actually have a question also, also like if you can give your testimony about how you came to become a believer how did God uh, how did you experience his love the first time and, uh, and also then answer more questions about how long that has been oh. In a home where I would have called it a Christian. Um, so since I can remember, my mom would like little prayers for us at the bedside and whatever. And then I think I was about nine years old or so. Uh, nine, yeah, I think nine years old, nine, ten years old. And we were at like a young people's group, like a YP on a Friday afternoon. And there were these two young girls and they just, uh, you know, spoke about stories that they they were like little missionaries or whatever. And then at the end, they said, hey, so who wants to give their heart to Jesus? And I was just like, dude. <laughs> and I looked around and like, there was only me and another little kid. I'm, I'll never forget his name was Harki, which means like herder or whatever. Yeah. He, was, he was seven years old and he said, my name is Harki and I'm seven years old and I'm giving my life to Jesus today. And I stood there and I was like, hand up in the air. And I, but now I was so shocked. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, what is wrong with these people? Why wouldn't they want to do this? You know? So anyway, I think through primary school, that kind of played out in a way in my heart. But then high school came and it just all went, went pear-shaped from there. Uh, you know, booze, balls, the whole nine. Okay. And then when I was in my uh, standard nine year, which was grade 11, in uh, 1989, uh, my dad had a very bad heart attack, um, like several heart attacks, actually. And he was in ICU for a long time and they didn't think to make it. My mom kind of kept it from us a bit, how serious it was. And then they had to fly him to another city. He ended up going into another heart attack when he got there and they had to do an emergency operation sure, uh, that, that to sign a form that he had less than 5% chance of survival. So oh. they basically said to mom, look, he's, he's dead. Uh, we're going to try to save him, but yeah, prepare his 9% chance he's dead. Anyway, he came to um, at 10 o'clock, I think the next day or something, and they managed to save him. You know, it was insane because, wow. um, because he, uh, yeah, he made it. And then four days later, he was able to tell them a story about how uh, he had seen an angel during the operation, had a conversation with the angel. Mm. Um, the angel had a message from him that he was going to live. And also he asked the angel what time it was. The angel said it was 5 a.m. And that's when the surgeon and the anesthetist said, that's weird because at exactly 5 a.m. is when we declared you dead, when we stopped your heart to do the Whoa. bypass operation. So he had been in ICU for several weeks. So he didn't know what month it was, let alone what day or what time. And he had very specifically wrote on a piece of paper, it was 5 a.m. Wednesday morning 
11 October 1989. Two days later, I got lost at sea for three days um, on a boat called the Vagabond, Vagabond. As, the, yeah. as the book says. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and that happened. So I got lost at sea. And then um, I still wasn't a Christian, really. And then in my first year out of school, 1991, my girlfriend broke up with me. And then I became a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad died. He's, and I get lost at sea for three, two massive stories. And a girl breaks up me, man. Wow. And I think that just spoke to the brokenness of my heart. Because, you know, I think we underestimate how sore our hearts really are. And we underestimate the power of not believing that you're loved and not mm. believing that, 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 that you're good enough. Yeah. And that's shame, right? So shame, as Brené Brown, the definition that sh the research as Brené Brown says, is shame is the master emotion. Deep in your heart, you believe you're just not good enough. Mm. And so you spend your life covering it. You spend your life proving that you are. But, but inside it just festers and festers and festers. And so... I became a Christian in 1991. Uh, so what's that? 29 years um, is the is the answer to wow. that question. Yeah, that's awesome. But but this is, this is important to say is that I was in 99 I was at Bible College in London after I played rugby in France and did all that. And then me, Lee, and I got married in 96, and I had my whole career and faith up potatoes and everything. But it was in 2013, many 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 years later, when I sat in a therapist's office. She was a Christian counselor. And a, and a psychiatrist, a qualified psychiatrist. And, and we sat there. And in the second session, I said to her, uh, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about my dad. And I told her these four stories of why I believe my dad loved me and why that was a question in my heart. And then I told her, and, and here's a story I want to tell you about why I believe my dad believed in me, because he had died three years before in 2010. And at his funeral, I actually shared some of these stories and say, you know, you know great guy and all this sort of thing. And she listened for an entire hour to me speak. And then right at the end, <laughs> she didn't say anything. She just said, time's up. And, uh, but I've just got one, one question for you. And I said, yeah, what is it? And she looked at me, my eyes, and she said to me, do you believe God loves you? Sure. And I knew what she was saying. She was saying, do you believe God loves you? Because you sure as heck don't think your dad does. Wow. And there's a leap that you need to make, and you haven't made it. And you can't make it because your heart is so broken and you haven't owned your story. And I'll, I'll never forget. I actually, I'll, I'll look it up real quick here. I got in my car and there was this, uh, there's a girl by the name of Audrey Assad. She's a, an American uh, singer. Yeah, yeah. And we know her music well. It's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I was going to quickly see her. I got in the car. I mean, I just, I had her music in my car. It's not like I listened to her that, that frequently but i but i had a music in my car but i also had 2000 other songs on my ipod remember those old ipods yeah i had this massive 65 gig ipod yeah. and, it, and it always randomly play music and i got in my car turned on the ignition because i was lightheaded by now i mean i was so shaken by what this lady had asked me it was like she'd taken a pin out of a hand grenade put it in my pocket and said good luck see you next week wow yeah time's which, up. Which, go deal which with was it. which yeah <laughs> she said this concrete walls built around this wound and I need to blow it up. I'm sorry, but Yo. it has to be blown up. I got in my car, turned the ignition, randomly a song started playing on my, on my car sound system and it was Audrey Assad. And, it's, and the lyrics are this, you've been let down, it's true. Your pain is so easy to see, you're haunted by your history and it feels like you've got no escape. Mm. Your, your life has left you high and dry. You used to be sure of yourself, but then your whole world went to hell and tomorrow looks just like today. So you lie in your bed and you won't let the morning come in. You hide in your room and you're feeding that fear and it's killing you. Don't you know it's killing me too? Because your heartbreak is breaking you. Mm. And I felt as I listened to the song, I felt the Holy Spirit whisper in my heart and say to me, I am that thing of God's glory reflecting his image through a person. And he's going, I'm reflecting through Audrey's song to you, my voice. And I'm singing this to you. Do you have any idea how heartbreaking it is to me to see you this heartbroken? And the reason is that you're not owning your story. Yeah. You're not owning it. You have to own your story. You have to go in there and you have to get real with me. And, and, and yes, you can tell me everything that you're disappointed about. You can tell me about every scar and about everything that happened. And then forgive him, you know. 
and then forgive yourself and then ask for forgiveness for yourself too, you know, and then the healing will begin. And then, gosh, dude, that's been a seven year process and it's still ongoing. I'm, I'm still undoing some of those onion layers of, of yeah. going like Paul prayed in, in um, Ephesians three, when he says, I pray with all my heart that you guys will be rooted and established in God's love. Because if you are, yeah, it changes everything. Sure. So, true. you know, so yeah, it's, it's, Powerful. this is, it's, it's a real journey and he gets in there, you know, and like I said, I was 43 years old at the time. I think I was 40, 19, 2013, whatever I was seven years ago. Yeah. 41, you know, so, so it's, I just love that God just orchestrated that because I walked straight into it. I mean, I was like, I'm just going to get this father thing away to the therapist. Like I sort this quick. And that's what became the next 12 sessions. Really. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's so good. So good. thank you for sharing that. That's, you know, I, I, that's a great thing about why I want people to, to hear these stories is because it's only when we really get vulnerable that, mm. that other people can go, oh, my word, I, I've that's that kind of thing has happened to me. I've been through something similar and we get encouragement. I'm encouraged by by your story. I'm encouraged by mm. by how God has just through a relationship. And in his gentle way, invited you to actually be a part of a story that he wrote for your life. And uh, I like how you say, own your story. You know, it makes me think of Psalm 139, where it speaks of how there's a scroll for each of mm -hmm. our lives written. Mm -hmm. and, and he knows the days that we have. And, and uh, you paint such a beautiful picture of, of him looking at us going, oh, man, you so much more, you know, you can, can, you can own this story so much better. Just, you know, just come and listen, just come and find out from me how, how it's supposed to go. And uh, sure, that's beautiful. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think but a super practical way man, of looking at it is like having a broken leg, just going, I don't have a broken leg. And you're just walking on that leg and it's string and it's getting green. Like, I don't have a broken leg. And like, oh, you. I mean, that's why God, and it's hard, you know, broken one thing, a broken heart. Oh, my word. Because that's why through a start company he said, dude, you've been let down. It's true. Mm -hmm. I know you don't think it's true. Yeah. You know, the thing is, my personality is is to go, I don't like pain, right? I don't, I don't, it's not a thing for me. To Some people love the intent of pain and they're just like, oh, let's beds and busy. I, I'd rather just have fun and have a joy. But I, but I think me, God was going like, Frank, you engage pain. You, you can't wait from the pain of your broken heart. You have to own it. And he was going, you've been let down. It's true. Mm. It's true, and I'm telling you it's true. Don't mm. walk away from the fact. Because my method was, well, it's, maybe it's not true. And if it's not true, well, then I have to deal with it. And if I don't have to deal with it, I don't have to engage the wound. Great. But meanwhile, I built a concrete wall around it. And no matter how watertight that concrete wall is, all the woundedness starts seeping out. And trust me, someone just touches that wound. Oi, vey. It's like that song in the 80s, me, I'm touchy. I'm touchy you. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny you just went from really serious to really funny and that's oh, i love that about you bro uh, okay we're, we're almost in the hour and uh this has been so wow. so good yeah i mean we can go um quick there, there is something that I, I mean i think we've we've already heard so much and been so blessed but something that i've that i've picked up at the, sort of when i read the end of your book and what you've learned and what you've gone mm -hmm. through I really think that there, there's such a such a truth about story that is relevant to to all of us in these weird times we're in and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of stuff we can debate and go on, on about but at the end of the day we all have to live through this time we have to navigate this time and it you know we may feel like we're on the ship and it's it's crazy there's storms it's 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 wild you know and you know we're trying to be like peter in the beginning and keep our eyes on jesus but the way big and the way strong and Tough. the uncertainty is so huge uh what would your word of encouragement for, for us be in this time to to navigate through this and and yeah just how, how would you advise that i sort of quick up scriptures if i if i may um uh, so hopefully my computer loads quicker than it normally does <laughs> um well in the meantime while the while my it's catching up there, there's words that are, that are milling around in my head all COVID-19 time and this pandemic time. And the two the two words that were milling around in my head, let me just get to it. Um, is, can I help you? I, got, me, I can help you and bring it up on screen even. 
You know what? You can I've got it? Yeah, I wanted to actually read it. It's Ecclesiastes seven verse eighteen. Okay. In the message. Cool. You can. Read okay. It. Yeah, go for it. I'll just read you quick. I've seen it all in my brief and pointless life. Yeah, a good person cut down in the middle of doing good. They're a bad person living a long life of sheer evil. So don't knock yourself out being good and don't go overboard being wise. He's not saying don't be good or don't be wise. He's just saying don't knock yourself out doing it and don't go overboard. Yeah. Believe me, you won't get anything out of it by going overboard. But press your luck by being bad either. And don't be reckless. Why die needlessly? And here's verse 18. This is the crux verse. It's best to stay in touch with both sides of an issue. A person who fears God deals responsibly with all of reality, not just a piece of it. Wow. And so for me, what that meant was, and, and I've spoken to a, a, a few groups of people about this, and the two words for me is one on the one spectrum, well, it's a spectrum, but on the one side is naivety, and you know, the other side is cynicism. When we're young, we tend to be naive, right? We tend to think everything's going to be cool, everything's going to work out, they might die, I'll never you know, whatever the case might be, just think of naivety like that. And then on the far side, we have cynicism and cynicism happens more when, when, um, when you have, uh, when you have just, when you get older and just everything's terrible, sorry, text messages through and distracting me. I'm trying to kill them. <laughs> cynicism on the far side is, is when you just think of everything in a pessimistic sort of view. And and when we get older, we go like, I've been around, I've seen everything, and yeah, everything goes for a ball of nothing, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, and and the thing is, you've, you, you can't live in either naivety or in complete cynicism. Because if you live in either, you go, oh, the government loves me, and they've got the best intentions for me. And on the far side of cynicism, you have, oh, there's a conspiracy theory behind all of this. See, yeah. wins in every doorknob, yeah. you know? So here's the crux scripture, Isaiah 49. You can pop it up if you want. Isaiah 49, verse 3 and 4. I'm going to quickly look it up here. And this is the antidote in my opinion. Uh, I, I, this one I read from the NIV. It says here, yeah, just quick context. In Isaiah 49, he's speaking to Israel, his servant. But we know that Israel in the long run, in the whole scope of the Bible, Ultimately failed in their in their purpose for God, and Jesus came and fulfilled the purpose. So yeah. when he speaks of my, of my servant, you can put Jesus in there. Yes. It says, he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. And then verse 4, but I said, I've labored in vain, and I've spent my strength for nothing at all. I just want to stop there briefly. <laughs> in, in this time, this pandemic, I, I remember in the middle there when our government was making some interesting decisions and calls and things like that, I started feeling like, oh, my word, I'm spending my strength in vain and for nothing. Like this is driving me insane. And yeah. so the cynicism was like coming at me like a train. And I think in life you can feel like that. I certainly did when I wrote my book in, 20, or in 2011 when my book starts playing out. A lot of that felt like that. And then I thought about Jesus, and I thought he lived a perfect life. And what did he get for it? He died on a cross, a criminal's death, murdered and executed, falsely accused, as bad as it gets. If there's no erection, then the first of that verse is 100% true. I've labored in vain, and I've spent my strength for nothing at all. But there is a resurrection, yeah. and we know it. And therefore, yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. Sure. And good luck to anyone trying to remove that reward from God's hand and taking away. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Just like the resurrection was always going to happen. It's, it's, and, and if you are in Christ, that scripture, which is true of Christ, and first and foremost true of Christ, the first fruits of our faith, it's true of you in Christ. And so the thing that I said to myself was what I've lost, whatever I've not gained or whatever, God will always take there of our lives, excuse the expression, and he'll turn it into fertilizer and it'll lead to new growth. <laughs> That's good. Just like Jesus said it this way, a grain of wheat will fall to the ground, it'll die, you think it's over, but it's only going to germinate and it's going to sprout and it's going to deliver more fruit. Wow. If you can look at it this way, then you won't be naive about the hardships of life and the tough things that are going to happen, like the crucifixion to Jesus and Jesus, pick up your cross and follow me. But on the other hand, you also won't be cynical saying this is all for nothing. Sure. 
That's great wisdom there, bro. I appreciate that. And I think it means a lot to all of us in this time. And, and that's a wise and healthy approach to, to this whole thing. And I would just add that uh, in, in order to do that, we need to stick close to God. That's because I, I find that when things seem to be going pear shaped, like you say, I like that. Uh, I, I need God's perspective. I can only get his perspective when I spend time with him and read his word. And then there's like this peace that comes. It's just overwhelming. And you kind of go, okay, oh, no. It's just, I, and, I, and I remember my own advice. I tell people, you know, what are you reading more of, the news or the good news? And we, need to, we need to spend more time on the good news and get perspective. Yes, don't be delusional. Don't be naive. But also know that as children of God, we, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And that has, you know, that has implications in terms of how we pray, how we deal with this, um, how we see these things, that, you know, there's, there's more going on than just people making interesting choices. There's, there's spirit at work. There's stuff happening. But we all have to first have given lives to Jesus to really be able to get in that place, to operate from that space. So anyway. No, I don't charge my Bible it every day. I, I Psalms and um, the book system. There's a couple of read commentaries and things to help me make it. In, but I don't read because I'm a goody chooser because or pleasing God in a sense. It, yeah. I read it because I, it's like I, I'm reading because I'm loving it. In a way, uh, I read it because I don't want to lose it, you know, sure. and I will probably lose it, you know, so. That's true. Yeah, I think the, the, the more I journey with God, the more I realize that, yes, I got saved and I gave my life to Christ, but it's actually a daily choice. And mm-hmm. because you don't do it once, then you're stood for life. Because I've, I've, I, I, you know, I tell you stories about, Two, three more times in my life, I had massive encounters with God where I realized, yo, I thought I was, you know, on the right, in the right place, in a good place. And then, like you say, the th- things fell apart first. And, and it was just God moving some stuff out of the way, showing you what you were really worshiping was actually this. And, You're uh, chasing, chase first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I was, I, I delivered a message yesterday where, where mm-hmm. I to, for church and, and I, I just felt God give me this question. Um, what is what is my expectation of God versus God's expectation of me? And mm. I, oh, I was just so challenged by that, by that question. I realized, man, I have expectations of God, you know, and, and it may not be anywhere near what he has in mind. So I need to lay those down and go, okay, God, what, what are your plans for me? And what is your expectation of me? Let me go with that. And let me put my energy into that. And I think that's, that's what I'm hearing from your story is where you got that, you know, you made the shift so important and seeing the fruit of this is amazing. Yeah, you know, a lot of expectations, but to have healthy expectations is, is an extremely important part for me anyways in, in when you're walking with because I think C.S. Lewis illustrated for me the quickest and the best when he said, I take you to a door and I say to you behind that door is a maximum security prison, horrible maximum security prison. And then we open the door and you walk through and it turns out it's like a city lodge holiday inn type hotel room with nice double bed, queen size bed, you know, with a duvet and a mini bar fridge and a hairdryer and a coffee station, private bathroom, TV, DSTV, the whole nine. You think, wow, this is, this is cool, actually. This is fantastic. Then I take another person to exactly the same door. And there's a hotel. I don't know if you know this in Las Vegas. It's the Palms Hotel. There's a room that costs $100,000 a night. Sure. Okay, so that's, that's almost two million rand a night. <laughs> and, I, and I say to you, hey, I know you've invested this hundred grand. You want to impress your lady. And I open the door and it's exactly the same room. I walk in, this guy freaks out. He's like, what are you kidding me? I could have paid $200 and got in the same room. It's another place. You ripped me off $100,000. He's freaking out. What's happened, okay, is that it's exactly the same conditions. The difference between the two guys were is that the expectations were different. Yeah. And here's the, here's the principle. Expectation controls experience. Yes. And experience will control how you feel about it and ultimately behave. So, good. so if you set yourself up with wrong expectations about what God is supposed to or not supposed to do in your life, it can be a long road. You know, it, Or if there's humility and understand and you start getting to know the Bible and, you, and you're working it, it can be very different. Yeah. Expectations control your experience. Sure. That's so true. Yeah. Amazing. Frank, yeah. what, a, what a great session to hang out with you. I really appreciate you. You've got so much love of God, so much peace, uh, just being out of how you speak and who you are. I really appreciate that. And um, I think people were really blessed. I was blessed, and I thank you so much. Um, just one practical question. 
Sorry. Thanks for having me, Brent. Of course, man. <laughs> it's such a such oh. a. Um, the practical thing that we've had people ask uh, where they can mm. get hold of your book. You can maybe just quickly tell them. Yeah, it, my book should be an exclusive books and CA, PNA, and all that. And if it's not, please ask them to order it. If you can, <laughs> and, it's, and it's not in stock, it'll be fantastic. Um, if not, and if you don't want to go to the stores, or you can go to my Instagram handle, Frank underscore Rotenbach. And in the in the, um, bio, the link that you click on, it books and they will go to your house. Uh, you can click link and then Frank Rotenbach on Facebook. You can also, there's the button there is bomb and you can purchase it. Awesome. Um, Thank you so much. No. Now, you guys can hear, uh, if you want to call the Frank or get your, to book him to speak in uh, vagabond at gmail.com and then get in touch with that way as well. Please go follow on Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. See what he's up to. There's some really funny videos of him uh, making Harley Davidson sounds. Uh, <laughs> I do like to entertain. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you are an entertainer. Uh, maybe, maybe you should give us your wheat eater before we end off today. I can do a, a chainsaw. <laughs> chainsaw, chainsaw, all right. <laughs> That's bad. I like it. It's so, it, no, it's freaking real, man. Well done. All right, cool. on that, on that fine note, and we should laugh, we should laugh. Uh, will you please pray for the people watching and listening, and then I'm going to yeah. end off with, uh, with a prayer for you, and, uh, and then we'll say bye cool. to everybody. Yeah. Uh, God, our Father, you are gracious and kind, Lord. You are slow to anger and you're rich in love and you have compassion on all pain. Lord, every single person that's been watching this uh, live feed, Lord, today, you know their hearts. You know their their hearts in, the, in, in its goodness and you know their hearts in its brokenness, Lord. I pray for your hand of grace to be over them. Um, Lord, I pray that the image that you put in them will become brighter and brighter. Mm. As every day happens, Lord, and I pray at the same time, Lord, as your image becomes brighter, that healing will come, Lord. Lord, we are your temples, and you've sent your spirit to live in us. Lord, I pray, um, take the little shacks we've built for ourselves, Lord, and turn it into majestic paths, Lord, for your glory. And I pray that every person that's watching in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just want to bring Frank, his wife, mm. his marriage, his, his calling, and his ministry to you. Lord, I thank you that, that you've given that you've walked this path with him, that he has, yeah, that he's owning his story, the story that you have for him, and the story that blessed many others. Thank you, Lord, that you take him, his wife, his calling, and his career from glory to glory and from strength to strength. In the name of Jesus, we just bless him with every heavenly blessing, and where every blessing in the heavenly places. And Lord, we just mm -hmm. we call him highly favored in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord, that you are with them as a family. And uh, mm. thank you for this for these sessions. Thank you for those that are to come. We pray that you bless this platform and, and that it will mm. reach everyone that it's supposed to reach with no mm. hindrance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bro, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, I really Times. enjoyed it. You are awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. Guys, remember to go and follow Frank. And <laughs> it's a pleasure, man. Remember to go follow him on uh, all his platforms and support his book. And uh, if you if your church does book him and can gather again, make sure you get there and, uh, and go shake hand and hello. Um, yeah, thank you so much. We will tomorrow be back at 1 for another Love Unlock session. And tomorrow we are chatting to a guy called Scott Lee. He's in the Valley of the States. He's going to get up very, very early uh, his <laughs> time so that he can speak to us at one hour time in South Africa. Uh, he's got some great stories. He's a, he's a missionary, an evangelist, he's a, and he's a coffee farmer. From, he's got a farm in Guatemala where he does mission work as well. So he's got some really cool stories. So come and join us at tomorrow. And then on Thursday, we've got Mr. Graham Power. And Friday, our mutual friend, Mr. Nico Panagiotopoulos. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be great. So please uh, join us for the rest of the weekdays this week. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. We love and appreciate you. Bye.